Welcome, everybody, to the new segment, Better on Draft Podcast, December 3rd, 2021. A quick promo, as later this week, we are actually going to have episode 275, that's right, 274 was this past Friday, 275 this week will be a special episode as we bring in Wendy Yingling from DG Yingling, that's right, one of the largest independent family-owned brewers in the country, uh, one of the old, or the oldest in the U.S., one of the oldest in North America, I think it's the second oldest in North America for all you trivia nerds out there, uh, when people try to throw you up and uh mess you up by saying you know oh what's the oldest brewery in north america when it's like molson corners uh but in the u.s it is yingling so we are excited that's going to be on released on wednesday the 8th so go check out wednesday the 8th for the yingling episode of better on draft my name is Ken. I am still staying sober, and I've got myself uh, two cans of Cerveza Athletica from Athletic Brewing. Uh, Nick, what are you drinking? I moved to the Two Roots New West IPA, and I just cracked open day three of the advent calendar. Um, Alms Hell is what it's called. Pretty straightforward. <laughs> <laughs> Wendy, what do you got over there? So I am still, I just finished up the Coonan's White Devil and I am still drinking the um, Cheeky Park from um, Wildworks Brewing Company. It is their Citra Dry Hopped Lager. Uh, It's delicious. It's nice and crisp and just very tasty right now. Awesome. Rob? Uh, Right now, since I I finished the, I believe it was the 20... 18 bottle of peanut butter jelly crime. I've now cracked, cracked open the 2019 bottle of 2019, which is smelling and tasting a lot better because I think the sulfites were just kind of done with that old bottle. We, we had Chris on and, from Four Fires Meadery. Sorry. We'll get there when we hit the button. Um, I'm assuming that's the one you're chugging. Um, that is the one that I'm chugging, which I'm just finishing off and pouring in the glass. Yeah, so ready to go. In the glass. We just had Chris on from Four Fires and was talking about the, the shelf life of craft of mead uh, in particular and how long mead can last on the shelf. And um, it's very, very interesting to say the least because I've never thought about uh, shelf life for mead in comparison to shelf life for beer or cider. So I don't have to worry too much about it because apparently it has a nice long shelf life. Uh, I'm not one that I it's it's been a minute since I drank some meat. I'm not going to lie. I when when the disease uh, hit the pandemic for the beginning of 2020, I hit bee nectar hard. And I was just buying cans upon cans upon cans because I think they were just trying to get rid of what they had on tap. Um, and I bought so much bee nectar at the beginning of that uh, time. So I uh, I need to get back there. Definitely try some more uh, stuff that they have. Sadly, it was a lot easier when I was in Detroit or growing up and living in Troy. Uh, now it's just you know a little bit of a hike. But I'm sure I can get out there and uh, show my support, uh, which you can find them, of course, on the Michigan Brewery Map app. Uh, so... Did I say? Did I ask everyone what they were drinking? I, f- I feel like. Yeah, yes. I think so. Yeah, you did. Perfect. Good. Well, as always, oh. with segment two. Here is Robert with the beer news. Uh, Rob, what was in that uh that glass? <laughs> Um, so what was in that glass was Dogfish Head's Utopia's Barrel Aged Worldwide Stout. You just um, drank like 20 bucks. <laughs> well, it's a good thing that I have four bottles of it. Um, so basically, this is obviously the Worldwide Stout that is aged in uh, Sam Adams Utopia's Barrels. Uh, which apparently it's not on the label. I had to look this up online, but apparently that this clocks in at somewhere around 17.3%. It's on her somewhere. It's not really on her, but that's pretty much where that is. So, hey, how you doing? Welcome. <laughs> uh, 
Yeah. Welcome. Let's, let's, let's talk some news. Um, I'm going to start off with my article a little bit. All right. Uh, just All right. Because I want to, to talk about uh, something we've talked about on the show, and I think there's a lot of stats that have come out uh, in information, and that is the Great Resignation. For those of you who don't know what the Great Resignation is, um, that is hitting the industry of restaurants and um, – gosh the service industry that's the words i'm looking for there you go the service industry uh we are seeing a massive amount of people leaving the industry these people are leaving it in droves for other jobs now uh, obviously with the culture that we're in right now it's a lot easier to find a job online because there are a lot of online jobs that you could do over the internet you don't need to go into a site um you don't need to do anything like that i did see a a tiktok which you can follow us on tiktok better on draft um of someone just making a reference to all the hysterical names for uh technology companies there are today uh including as as i used to work for toast and of course our competitor breadcrumb um, and then there is Spot On and Lavu and yeah, it's Revel. Um, some of these technology companies, just hysterical names. But if you go to Bart Watson, uh, which is at Brewer Stats on Twitter, you can see a lot of numerical information, including the last 12 months of job growth versus um, they call it the quits rate uh, for the food service industry. Um, now, during the last six months, uh, the quit rate is actually really, really high, um, and that's even including the fact that the wages are going up within the industry itself. So if you're looking at this graph, which of course we'll put it in the show notes for you, uh, but this is a article that he posted on November 12th at 3.37 p.m. Eastern, uh, you can see the six most recent months where wage growth has increased yet uh quit rate has exploded um and the six months before that uh the quit rate wasn't necessarily all that high it was actually extremely low a lot of people probably were holding off on their jobs to see if their jobs were going to come back or they were working on something else but with the great resignation that doesn't just include servers bartenders uh this includes chefs and cooks it includes um, sommeliers, it includes managers, it includes everyone within the industry itself. And a lot of them, people either age out uh, just because they got older and they were done with the, the position. A lot of them aged out because they were younger and it was a starting job. Um, one of the big numbers to pay attention to is that a lot of women left the industry. Um, and a lot of women left the industry because of home child care. They left it or they needed to take care of someone at home, uh, whether it's a child or someone elderly. Um, so not necessarily just child care, just home care of someone else. If there's a better word for it, I might not uh, know it off the top of my head. I was trying to look at Wendy because I know she cares for her. Grand- elder care. Elder care. I mean, it- <laughs> well, I, I mean, it's it, elder care and child care. I was hoping for there was like a, a single word that encompasses all of it. Um but uh, women in the industry even um, have left in droves specifically. Um, a lot of people, as I kind of mentioned, that you could find jobs online that you don't need to go into an office or a building anymore. Um, therefore, competition is across the country. And people like myself and Ypsilanti can compete with someone in California for the exact same job of a company that is in Missouri. Uh, so a lot of these things added up and have exploded to create an issue within the industry. Now, uh, as restaurants, um, there, there's two factors here. One, um, wages were pretty stagnant, and therefore a lot of people left to go find something a little bit more consistent. Um, and there are places that are doing well because they are hiring, they are paying well. That's why some place like North Center Brewing, um, who – uh, had mentioned it to me. Uh, they looked for, they were hiring and they were able to hire really, really fast because they were offering really good benefits, wage, um, and the fact that they were going to, you know, someone was going to make money. They were going to make a living at that company, whereas not everyone can afford to pay a living. Um, and I think it showed a lot of, uh, problems within the restaurant and hospitality industry that we knew about that needed some type of catastrophe to kind of let the entire Jenga game fall apart. Um, So as I discuss about the great resignation, 
the things that you're going to start seeing within the industry is one, a lot of restaurants are going to close and it's not because of the pandemic as a whole. It's going to close because they were on razor thin margins as it is and they couldn't afford to uh, be in business in the modern business that is the service industry. Um, there are places that are going to stay open. There are places that are going to be short staffed. But as a consumer, my first question to you guys is that have you been to places recently? So not, you know, we're, we're 18 months into this. Uh, have you been to places recently where you're seeing um, shortages of employees? Um, how were the employees reacting and how, more importantly, how did you react to the business that did not have uh, the proper staff? So I'm going to start with Rob on this one, um, as I'm sure, you know, family dinner somewhere. <laughs> I mean, I'm going to say, I mean, it's the, not even just even going with family dinner, just being as a trivia host and working in a bar where I have a bunch of teams who are looking for service and, you know, kind of going uh, on about the women who have left the business. Most of them have left the service industry primarily because there's a bunch of dirty ass fucking old men and a bunch of young ass fucking old men who don't know how to treat women in the service industry. And they're leaving because the, it's not worth dealing with their bullshit to get paid pennies on the dollar plus tips to deal with that shit. So I can understand it with, with them, with them leaving. Um, and there's, there's studies that I've been seeing coming out, which, you know, it's not necessarily going on about those who have left the service industry, but those who have left work and quit in general, that there's a bunch of people who have been quitting because they want to create their own business. They want to create, you know, they start to have their own hustle and, and run their own business. So I, I would imagine that there are people who are in the service industry who are in that group. Um, now, as far as like where I am right now with, with hosting my, my normal Monday show that, you know, they have been getting more service people in the, the bar, uh, whether or not they're actually paying them more, that part, I don't know. I don't, I don't have that information on, on, on hand, but, you know, from, from seeing it from, from a host perspective that, there have been more people coming into the bar because there is more staff. But at the same time, for a lot of them, in, in, I think in, in, in their eyes, there's not enough staff that, that's taking care of them. And my, my perspective on it is just tough shit. Um, there's enough people that are in there that, you know, hopefully you should be grateful for that they are working and they, that they're there, that they want to serve you. And hopefully they, they, they shouldn't have an issue with taking care of you, but you know, it's, it's not going to be, I, we're, we're way past the point where we're going to be that there's going to be like seven servers in your damn area where everybody can give you a, a glass of water or some, some shitty olive garden bread. I'm sorry. That's just, this is where that shit is gone. <laughs> I, wow. I mean, hey, I don't go to Italian McDonald's. Fuck Olive Garden. <laughs> wow. Tell me how you really feel. Someone woke up with violence today. <laughs> I mean, at least he chose it via vocalizing on a podcast and not anything. Right. Else. Oh, no, oh, oh, um, there, the only the only time I will ever quote Nene, I said what I said. <laughs> Nene leaks. <laughs> That's it. Oh <laughs> gosh, she's a trip, man. There are a lot of places that you're going to go to where just because uh, there are open spots doesn't mean they have places for you to sit. Um, just because there is a table and a seat doesn't mean that's a spot for you to sit just because that, because they don't have the staff. If they don't have the staff to cover that, you know, your Rob, Rob mentions it, they're looking around looking for staff to serve them, but they sure as shit can't find it just because there, there isn't enough people. And we, being in the industry, a lot of people had, you know, misconceptions and misnomers, some valid, some not about, you know, a person playing on their phone and not serving them. 
Um, but when you're severely understaffed and you're the only server, you don't have time to play on your phone anymore. You're going to be <laughs> serving, you're going to be busting your ass, and you're still not going to be able to find someone. But what about you, Wendy? I mean, you you had the luxury of being uh, on a cruise recently, but uh, obviously you can't, um, you know, you, was, was the service the same on the cruise versus normally? And what about... Yes. Okay, service was the yep, same? Yep, 100%. Way. The service was awesome. I have no complaints about any of the service that we received. Um, I think people were a lot more... Um, there were a few people that we saw that were trying to exert their privilege but for the most part people were very understanding and excited to be on this cruise uh it was it was at 50 percent capacity so um very rarely did you actually have to wait for anything um they just they wanted to take care of us and they were happy that we were there and we were happy that they were there taking care of us so i don't think that that was really that wasn't an issue but I have seen um, locally a lot of restaurants that are um, closing at earlier times. They're, my sister and my brother-in-law were trying to bring food home for us. And they went to six different restaurants that were closed at like five o'clock in the afternoon because they did lunch and, and for breakfast and lunch. And then they had to close down because they didn't have enough people to work the rest of the day. So there is that. Um, for the most part recently, I haven't seen anybody who's um, out of control. There hasn't been any Karens at the places that I've been that are like, I need to be served right this minute. I think people are just being more patient, which is what they needed. The reason that people are leaving the service industry is not just because of wages, but it's because they had bad, they had poor wages and they were treated like crap on a regular basis. Like they're here to help us, not for you to tear them down. And as, as Rob said, there is a stigma, you know, uh, we, we all know the bars, we all know the servers that it happened to, uh, where, you know, men were really just terrible customers. Um, and I, I recall, and, and you, you have the ones that are learned to just shrug it aside, which never should have been a thing that you needed to learn. Um, but, uh, unless you're working at like an Ed DeBevix or something like that, where the job's to be an asshole and the customer's going to be an asshole back because you're an asshole, you know, like those kinds of things. But I, I recall there, there was a really interesting um, dynamic that happened uh, that involved my father. Uh, my, my, there, my dad and I bowled together in a league five years ago, we'll say. Uh, the years don't matter, but five years ago. And I remember... The, the waitress accidentally walks into him while he's trying to, like, tie a shoe and she's trying to serve. Nothing gets spilled or anything like that. Um, and, like, they, they have a tussle back and forth that, ex like, accelerated super fast. And she, thickest fucking skin ever, um, you know, can quip it right back. If you're in a bowling alley with 200 men plus and they're, they're being drunk idiots, uh, you have to have thick skin to deal with that kind of people so she's going back and like it was escalating to for no reason at all because my dad wasn't trying to be an asshole but she was quipping back and then he didn't like that she was quipping back um but what was so funny and god bless my father uh i told him what happened and he called and apologized to her um, because he couldn't wait till the, the bowling the next week. He didn't want a whole week. He realized what happened and literally called the bowling alley and said, hey, when is this person working? I need to um, uh, apologize. And they obviously wouldn't give him, tell him, because, you know, <laughs> you can't call a place and ask when someone's working. Um, but he left his number and she called back thinking it was me. Same name. Um, and realized what happened. And it's just such a... a there's there's positives and negatives that can come out of those types of uh, characteristics. But the reason I bring up the story is is that she shouldn't have had to have grown that thick skin. Um, and the reason that she mm -hmm. deals with that job is because she has 200 people. Not she's you know she wasn't the only bartender, but 200 plus people who are drinking for four hours straight that she can serve and make a shit ton of money. 
but you know how much is your worth how much is your men, men, mental health worth how much is your you know because these guys aren't you know they're handsy they're gonna do dumb things so how much is your tolerance for men doing dumb shit this is my that tolerance way. for men doing dumb <laughs> shit is very minimal already um but I mean, that, that's us but i mean as as far as a woman is concerned i mean there's there's infinite levels of men's shit that women have to put up with that um yeah it, it's 2021 and we're not even close to fixing that shit <laughs> well i uh I, well go on wendy you looked like you were about to talk sorry um uh, keep in mind that most of those women who are putting up with that infinite shit were taught that they have to put up with that shit yes it wasn't Preach. until recently that we were told <laughs> you don't have to deal with that mm-hmm. uh, yeah. nick what about you i mean you got a you got a newborn you got uh um you know your your family is out there in-laws going out to eat what's your experience been like so the last few months, we really haven't really gone to many restaurants. Um, I'm, I'm actually kind of glad that some of the restaurants that we've been to have been, for the most part, pretty stable with respect to levels of service. So not to say that it's lacking, uh, like in the staffing department, but overall, the experiences have been pretty good, Host, you know. So I necessarily, not necessarily, I can't really complain. However, where I'm seeing a lot out, um, on this neck of the woods, maybe not so much in restaurants. Again, we do a lot of DoorDash and um, drive-through, especially with Brody. He's only up for so many hours a day and we want to hang out with him. Um, a lot of the stores like around here in Shelby Township, outside of the service, outside of the service industry, are just taking a pounding right now. Like the biggest one that comes to mind right now is the, is the Kroger right down the street from us. Um, just starting to see their hours just get smaller and smaller and smaller. Like I went there today, they close at 10 o'clock. Now they usually wow. are open until midnight. Right. The, the, um, if you're not a fan of going to get your groceries and using uh, uh, the pickup, option you know park in they throw it in your car and you can go the last like three or four times they've actually called my wife and said we're three or four hours behind you have to come at three four hours later the biggest problem with that is tara gets the phone call at 9 a.m kroger's been at least open for at least three hours at that point mm -hmm. so how can you fall that far behind three, four hours in the opening of your store and you're already telling your customers four or five hours late that we're, that's how far behind we are already. So I, that's where I'm seeing it the most out here um, is not so much in service, but it's in the stores at least. 24 so. hour places like Meyer and McDonald's that are, they, not they're not 24 hours anymore. I, I, I they're not you guys understand. This is the new normal. Uh, there will not be many 24 hour stores or 24 hour, yeah. you know, get, like, getting your 3 a.m. McDonald's after you were at the bar for six <laughs> hours ain't happening much. Anymore. No, it's not. And there's like, there, so I'm again, Shelby Township. It's pretty close to, to the farms out of all the restaurants that are nearby, like all the fast food type places. There's only one that's open late and that's McDonald's. The Taco Bell is closed. The White Castle is closed. The Burger King is closed. All of those other restaurants that you can expect to go get your late fourth meal, you can't get them. The only place that you can get it at is McDonald's. And I don't even know for how even late they stay open. Um, I, I had another thought and, and it already slipped my mind. Oh, uh, a couple of months ago, we were going to go do Little Caesars, grab a hot and ready because we we're trying to finish this basement for Brody's birthday. They closed at four, four p.m. Oh my like, holy! What time did they it, open? It, oh, I don't know. Probably for lunch. I'm just curious. I don't know. <laughs> like, uh, like, what's the what's the even point of even opening at four at, or closing well, at four? Probably their big business. Yeah, but, but but that's that's the thing is that you know, as being uh, someone who works in project management, that that is the cascading effect of what happens when a project and while it's not necessarily a project but it is a project 
cascades to a point where it gets to a point where people can't do the job at that time. Yeah. And it's like going back to your Kroger thing, more and less, more or less, what's probably happening is that they're trying to make sure that those things can go through without having to disrupt um, you know, disrupt having those those uh, shipments and pickups go through until the absolute last minute where they know they can't do it. And that's when they'd let you know, hey, we got to wait three or four hours. It, it sucks. We've yeah. been trying. And unfortunately, we took it too far to try and make sure that it could happen at the time you wanted it. But now it's it. we can't do it. Yeah. And it, it now, feels now like we're it's too into late. The world of the rest of the world and how the rest of the world <laughs> acts. Yeah, it, mm-hmm. like it's it's just you know, I don't know it's it's just crazy. Yeah. I mean, I mean, luckily, luckily, I can go to my to the pharmacy and go get my medication right away and not have to worry about it. But whenever I want to go get milk at the farm at the at the CVS. There's only one person doing the checkout and 10 people in line, but those 10 people in line don't realize the two self checkout counters right at the end of the, of the thing. So I just skip the line and go right to the self checkout. That's, that's, oh. it's just crazy that, you know, in just a short little while, how much has changed and very likely not going back to the way pre March 2020, I'd say. Well, so- I mean, that, go ahead, Wendy. On the flip side of what we're talking about, um, I can think, I, I mean, I was one of them. They, I can think of 10 to 20 people off the top of my head that have left their position and gone to a new position. Because the pickings prime right now. Like, the people who are having a hard time getting employees most often, and I'm not going to say it's every time because that is not the case, Yeah. but most often it is the people who aren't treating their employees the way they should be. As far as jobs are concerned, it is a buyer's market. It is mm-hmm. a buyer's market. It is a buyer's market. I, I, Being in utilities, I can't even tell you how many, uh, well, I, well, we're going through attrition right now. A lot of people retiring and coming back six months later as contractors. I don't know why, but that's totally, there is they realized we're, retirement's not a, it's cracked up to be. Yeah. Well, I think they get bored. I think that's what happens or they, they just, they just love the job and they can't get away from it. Uh, um, I have no idea. I, my, my dad turned 72 days ago and I honestly think he, he, he's got a degree. He GM paid for a degree. He needs to go into teaching or some shit. Second that would be uh, for, for for your dad. That would probably be like the the biggest best money maker post post like work like do it as a contractor. And for, for those who obviously you know don't know my father personally, because most people listening to this podcast, <laughs> um, my dad. Was it's a- mostly his family people. You know, it's mostly his family that's watched, listens to this my, struggling podcast. My dad was a seven twelves, like worked seven twelves for probably the last thirty years. Um, doesn't take vacation unless he needs to, and it is just a ridiculous. So, like him having a break, like this is a guy that had leg surgery and like two days later was mowing the lawn because he can't sit still. Hey, come on, Ken Senior, what are you doing, man? Yeah, he, he, <laughs> Fucking crazy! I I, I see it, it to his face now, like flat out. He can't hit me. No, can d- d- you you watched Family Guy, right? Yeah. Would you equate your dad to the equivalent of Peter Griffin's dad, who just can't ever seem to get away from the factory? Because oh, yeah. that man, because he that's all he did. That's all. He, like he would like curse at his at his dad and his wife at, at Lois. Like I want to go back to work, and they clearly won't let me because. He was too old and he had to retire. So um, I, I know we kind of talked a lot about that uh, thing that uh, <laughs> uh, the great resignation, but I think it's a really important story that a lot of people understand because a lot of people don't understand. The it's why. extremely relevant. It's it's not just relevant in like grocery stores. It's relevant to the ser- like we said, the service industry. Craft beer is a service industry. That's that's what it is. You want to go you you want a beer? Well, they're brewing it. You got to go there and go get it. I mean, it's going to impact, it. but you know, I think, I think we're craft brewers have always been so self-conscious about that 
those types of issues that they're always willing to go a little extra as much as they possibly can. It is still a small business and they are a business. They still need to make money in order to function, but they've always been a little bit more cautious than I think in my opinion, than some of these chain places, you know, that, you know, general, per- that's just general perception, my opinion, but it always seems they, they, they seem to care a little bit more about their employees than some of these national chains. That's just, you know, my two cents get off my, soapbox there for a minute just but. remember nick the only difference between ordinary and extraordinary is just is that extra, little extra, little extra. 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 Yep. <laughs> and you know what that actually and, and again that to, to some people maybe even most people that little extra is what makes all the difference in the world to make them like their jobs and ride this crazy thing out right so <sighs> I, I was looking at the, the articles that we have left, and I I think we need something a little bit more uplifting. Uh, Rob, I'm going to put yours uh, next week. Um, okay. <laughs> I mean, it's slightly uplifting, but not. No. So, yeah. Fair. Uh, Wendy, Fair. talk to me. What, what do you got on your article? So, I am constantly looking up women in the beer industry And I found a story uh, back from August. So it's a little bit, um, it's a little bit in the past, but it is about the story of the first IPA day. The international IPA day uh, was created by Ashley Routson, who is the beer wench. I'm sure that we've all seen her stuff on social media um, or read an article by her or something along those lines. Um, August 4th, 2011 was the first day Um, she kind of took the idea from a friend in the wine industry. He had created Cabernet Day and she thought we really need to do something like this. And uh, um, I always thought it was a big brewing type of thing that happened. It was definitely not. It was a grassroots effort. Um, The way that she touted it was a grassroots movement to unite the voices of craft beer enthusiasts, bloggers, and brewers worldwide through social media. So it blew up. It is the first um, social media movement of the craft beer industry. And I really just wanted to um, get that out there. It was on www.beeredge.com. I wanted to just talk about it because I think it's amazing that um, she just took this idea that a friend of hers had and tweaked it to her own benefit. And it has just been turned into a worldwide phenomenon. Drink IPA, or excuse me, IPA Day. Drink IPA Day. What is it called? Nope it's Nash. It's International IPA Day. The hashtag is um, hashtag IPA Day. So plan for next year IPA Day. Uh, August. It is the yep yeah, first Thursday of the month every August. First Thursday of the month every August. Uh, what a better way to drink on a thir- or reason to drink on a Thursday than to uh, drink for right an IPA. Do I have to drink an IPA though? That's the well, thing is that I was, I was just thinking, Thursday. I was just thinking for Ken is that that you have to have an IPA that you can actually drink and granted for, for not only for him, for myself as well, because I have been getting very tired of IPAs. I really, really have been. I like, I like B43. <laughs> so I don't think that's necessarily true. If you read the article, she talks about, Um, how it was just a way for craft beer um, enthusiasts to talk about what they were doing. They picked IPA because it was the most popular style at the time. It was trendy. They thought people could get behind it, but not every um, post is necessarily about IPAs. It is mainly just a way to get the craft beer industry to come together and have a conversation. So so kind of more of maybe a craft beer day? (laughs) Well, we now have IPA. those, but IPA yeah. Day was the first. We have a national, international South Day. We have an international mm-hmm. craft beer day. We've got craft beer week in like every state. We've got national craft beer day. There's all kinds of days like that, but this was the original. This was what started it. Yeah. Uh, yeah she would... has a book out too from uh, 2015 mm-hmm. called The Beer Wench's Guide to Beer, an unpretentious guide to craft beer. That yeah, can, if... uh, you can get... 
I'm curious who would be in there because this book is from 2015, so I'm guessing it was written in 2014. And if you look at 2014 craft beer industry versus today, uh, obviously it's exploded and it's a lot different. I We're probably like about 2,000 craft breweries short. No, more than that. I mean, we were we're we're around 8,000, I think, right now. At that time, we were probably in the 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 two to three thousand in 2014. It's uh yeah craft craft beer had that that 15 16 17 explosion uh which you can find the numbers of for michigan at least over on betterondraft.com you can find all the michigan numbers and which breweries opened and when um sort for all that fun stuff and of course you can just find all the open ones now at the michigan brewery map app on your android and ios uh free for you free for brewers to be on we have upcoming breweries in fact including an upcoming brewery that i found out about in wayne michigan Wayne, Michigan is about to get mm-hmm. a brand new brewery at the old Wayne Library uh, in Senior Center. Um, what? I, that's that's my job is to know all these things. So, yes, there is a ah, brewery. Garden City, what are you doing? <laughs> right? You're right. You're right next door. <laughs> Uh, so you can find out about that brewery as well as all the other upcoming breweries by downloading the app. Uh, that's going to do it for the news segment. Again, stay tuned later this week for the release of Better on Draft 275. Uh, that is the Yingling episode. Uh, we have two more episodes this year. Uh, we're going to be doing an episode next next two Fridays, and then we're going to be taking two weeks off because it is the holidays, uh, and we will be back in January. So make sure you uh, join us for one of them. Grab a beer, uh, and um, yeah, just <laughs> join us. Join us live, 7 p.m. Eastern Fridays. That's going to do it. The news segment, no matter what you think of your beer, we think it's better on draft. Have a good night. Peace.